Hello and welcome to a video tutorial designed to aid those people studying towards the BSc Level 1 accreditation. We've principally designed this for our own trainees our own department, but of course we'd like to share it as widely as possible because it may be of benefit to you. If you're interested in studying for the BSc Level 1 accreditation, the accreditation pack and the minimum data set can both be downloaded from the BSc's website. During this tutorial I'm going to assume that you've got a basic knowledge of cardiac anatomy and how that anatomy appears on ultrasound and we're mostly going to be focusing on which images you should be obtaining, how to optimise those images and what you need to do, what assessments you need to make when you have those images. Okay so we're going to start with the parastatal long axis view and I've asked Oscar our healthy volunteer to lie in the left lateral position although I appreciate that in critical patients we don't always have that luxury. And we're going to place the probe somewhere around about the third or fourth intercostal space just left of the sternum with the orientation marker pointing towards the right shoulder. So this is the first of our views that's described in the minimum data set. It's a parastatal long axis view but it's a deep parastatal long axis view. And you can see that we could probably have caught all of the heart within the sector if we'd set the depth to sort of 12 or 13 centimetres but we've deliberately increased the depth down to 19 centimetres so the lower third of the, of the screen is filled with sort of extra cardiac structures. You've got the descending aorta, which we'll highlight now, and then you can see below that the left hemithorax. And the sort of the main reason for doing this view is to look for any extra cardiac fluid, so any pleural fluid that's going to be running below the descending aorta, or any pericardial fluid that will track between the left ventricle, left atria, and the descending aorta. Also make sure that you look for any pericardial fluid that's anterior to the right ventricle. From our deep parasternal axis, we're going to decrease our depth and we're going to come up to a cardiac focused image. And so now we're going to decrease the depth to 14 centimetres so that we can still see a little bit of the descending aorta. We make sure that all the pericardium is in view, we've not cut off any of the left atrium. We're going to rise the focus point, bring it up into the near field so it's at the level of the aortic valve. So now we're getting to see the heart close up for the first time and we're going to get to form our first impression of a number of the chambers of the heart, uh, including the left and right ventricles. So what do we need to assess in this view? Well, we need to look at the left ventricle first of all. We're going to look at the LV cavity diameter. We can do this in either 2D or M mode, and we'll show you how to do this in 2D in this video. We're going to have a look at the LV wall thickness, and then we're going to have a look at how those walls thicken during systole. We're going to have a look at the right ventricle outflow tract in the near field. We're going to have a look at the size of that and its contractility. And then we're going to look at the aortic valve leaflets, how thick they are, and whether they open and close normally. We're going to do the same for the mitral valve. And then we're going to have a think about the root aortic root diameter as well. Okay, so the first of the things we're going to assess LV cavity diameter, we're going to do that separately in a second from a frozen image. What about LV wall thickness and thickening? Well, which, bit, which bits of the LV can we see here? We've got the basal and part of the mid-segments of the anteroceptal wall, that's in the near field, and then in the far field we've got part of the infralateral wall. And what we want to see is the size of the, sort of the thickness of a wall and we're going to say that anything up to about 12 millimetres is normal, and anything beyond that is hypertrophied. And then we're looking, more importantly, for the thickening of that wall. We want to see it thicken at least 50% during systole. If it thickens less than 40%, we're going to call that hypokinetic. If it thickens less than 10%, we're going to call that akinetic. We want to make sure that the walls are moving towards the centre of the LV cavity during systole, and make sure that none of the walls are moving in the opposite direction away from the centre. With respect to the RVOT size, we're not going to measure that here, but we are going to make a visual estimate. And if you look down the right-hand side of the image, you can see in the near field the right ventricle, and below that the aortic valve and the aortic root, and below that the left atrium. And broadly speaking, each of these structures should be roughly the same sort of size, and each should occupy a roughly about a third of that line going down. This is also the first opportunity to get a sense of the RV systolic contractility. And so when we're thinking about the RV systolic contractility, we're going to divide that into the longitudinal function and the radial function. And here we get a sense of the radial function. You can see the RV free wall coming in during systole. And if a patient has got a severely failed right ventricle, you'll notice that that just doesn't happen. Next, we're going to take a look at the aortic and the mitral valves. What we're looking for in the valves is we're looking for the leaflet thickness, whether they open well, whether they sort of the leaflets come apart and allow blood to flow from the first chamber into the second whether or not the leaflets close together, they coapt nicely, and so whether or not they fall back beyond the annular plane, so whether there's any prolapse or flail segments. It's beyond the scope of a level 1 study to exclude infective endocarditis, but you may well see vegetations on the valves, and you should keep an eye open for those. Now, I mentioned that one of the things we had to do was to assess the LV cavity size. 
and we do this with a single one-dimensional measurement of the LV internal diameter. We do this at end diastole. You can do this in M mode if you can get the M mode cursor to line up perfectly parallel to the LV walls. However, I find that in practice that's often not possible. And so we've done this on a frozen frame. So we've frozen our 2D image, scrolled back to end diastole. So end diastole you're going to have your aortic valve closed, I haven't opened yet. The mitral valve is just starting to close and the, the marker is on the R wave of the QRS complex on the ECG at the bottom of the image. And we're going to measure from the inner edge of the intraventricular septum down to the inner edge of the infralateral wall. We're going to be carefully cutting through that subvalvular apparatus and chordae and not including those in our measurement. You can see here for Oscar we've got a measurement of 5.4 centimetres which is well within the normal range for a male. Now we're going to use colour flow for the first time. So we're going to create a colour flow box and we're going to create this box over the aortic valve so it covers all of the valve leaflets throughout all of the cardiac cycle then extends to cover the left ventricular outflow tract, which is obviously where any regurgitation is going to appear. Key thing is this box needs to be big enough to cover the regurgitant jet, so if, regurg if there is regurgitation, the regurgitant jet extends beyond the limits of the box, you need to make your box bigger so that it covers all of that jet. And to be sure that there is no regurgitation, you need to pan through the valve. So get the valve in the middle of your image, then tilt the tail of the probe such that the valve disappears in one direction, and then tilt back through the centre all the way to the other extreme of the valve to ensure that there's no regurgitation that's hiding without outside of your imaging sector. We're going to do exactly the same for the mitral valve now, so we're going to move the colour box so that it sits over the mitral valve leaf that's covering the left atrium. And there you can see that we're going to pan through the valve until it disappears, pan back through the valve, and only once we pan through it we'll be happy that there's no aortic regurgitation that we're missing. The final assessment to make in the parasite along axis view is the aortic root diameter. So in the BSE minimum data set it suggests that this should just be a visual assessment. In our unit we tend to measure this. So we're going to zoom in on the aortic valve so that we minimise any measurement error. And then we're going to freeze that image and we're going to scroll back until we get to end diastole. It's an end diastolic measurement. Now this is an unusual measurement because we're going to measure from what they describe as leading edge to leading edge. So from the outer aspect of the aorta in the near field to the inner aspect of the aorta on the far field. And we're going to measure across the widest part of the sinus where we'd expect the coronary arteries to arise. So we can see for Oscar we've got a diameter of 3.3 centimetres. If we compare that to our normal gram here we can see Oscar under 39 years, body surface area probably around about 2 metres squared and that's comfortably below the dilated line. OK, so at this point we're now going to move on to a parasternal short axis view. So there's four parasternal short axis views and we're going to start at the level of the great vessels or at the level of the aortic valve. So we put our aortic valve in the middle of our parasternal long axis and rotate the probe clockwise approximately 90 degrees. So the orientation marker is now pointing somewhere between the midclavicular line on the left hand side and the left hand shoulder. And what we want to see is a nice round circular ring around the sort of up the aortic valve annulus and we don't want to see any of the left ventricular outflow tract or left ventricle in this view. From here, in a second, we're going to slowly pan through the left ventricle, and the things we're going to try and look for as we go through the parasternal short axis views are the number of aortic valve leaflets, so usually three leaflets, but bicuspid aortic valve is very common, um, the aortic valve leaflet thickness and motion, and then we're going to have a look at the right ventricle, the right ventricle outflow tract, the size and, and the radial contractility here, and then as we go down into the left ventricle, first of all we'll see the mitral valve and we'll look at the thickness of those leaflets and their motion. And then we're going to get into the body of the left ventricle and we're going to move through three levels of the left ventricle, through the basal left ventricle, the mid and then the apical left ventricle. And we're going to be looking at the radial contractility and this is a fantastic place to look for regional war motion analysis which we'll discuss as we get to them. So now we've achieved our parasternal short axis view at the level of the great vessels. We can see that the aortic valve is indeed tricuspid. You can see it has thin leaflets that are opening and closing well. We can also see that the aortic valve annulus is pulled up towards the RV3 wall during systole, so there's good radial contractility. Now, one of the things that we always do in our department at this point is put some colour over the aortic valve to look for aortic regurgitation. It's not one of the um, BSC level 1 standard views, but it's a reasonably easy and quick thing to do at this point. You can see here we're looking for regurgitant flow within the sort of aortic valve annulus during diastole. And whilst there's no aortic regurgitation, eagle-eyed viewers will spot that there's a small amount of regurgitant flow within the right ventricular outflow tract, and there's trivial or maybe mild uh, pulmonary regurgitation, which is a, a normal variant. 
From here, we're going to slowly pan down into the left ventricle. So we're going to tilt the tail of the probe towards the right shoulder so that we move the imaging sector slowly laterally. And we're going to first come to the LV at the level of the mitral valve. Here you can see the anterior mitral valve leaflet in the near field, and in the far field, the much smaller posterior mitral valve leaflet. You can see that both of these open nicely during, uh, during diastole and close during systole. As we pan further into the left ventricle, we start to encounter the subvalvular apparatus of the chordae and then projecting into the ventricle of the papillary muscles. And what we want to do is we want to follow the papillary muscles into the left ventricle cavity until they appear to be or are part of the left ventricular wall. So when we first encounter them, they'll appear to be floating, there'll be blood all the way around the papillary muscles, and then as we move further and further laterally with our imaging sector, we'll see that they form part of the LV wall. And that's where we're going to take our slice at the mid-level. Here we can get a sense of left ventricular radial contractility, and very usefully we can see all of the coronary artery territories in the same view. Whilst there is variation amongst normal individuals, the inferior and inferior septal segments are typically supplied by the right coronary artery, the inferior lateral and the anterior lateral are typically supplied by the circumflex, and the anterior and anterior septal are typically supplied by the LAD. It's really important here to scrutinise each segment individually. You can see in this image that as well as we've tried, the lung's coming in from laterally, and so it's very difficult to see the anterior and the anterior lateral walls, and they're only really visible during systole. Finally, we're going to take a look at the intraventricular septum. We're going to look for flattening of the intraventricular septum. We're looking for the septum being pushed away from the right ventricle in towards the centre of the left ventricle. And if that's occurring predominantly in diastole, then that's suggesting right ventricular volume overload. And if that's predominantly a systolic phenomena, then that's suggesting pressure overload. Of course, the two frequently coincide. We're going to pan further down to the apex now. We're going to see our fourth and final cut of the paraternal short axis which is down at the level of the apical LV. We're going to leave the parasternal window now and we're going to move to the apical window. So we're going to move the probe over to the apex of the heart and we're going to have the orientation marker pointing to the patient's left. And what you want in this apical four-chamber view is to have the apex of the left ventricle at the top of the image with the septum running straight down the middle of the image. Here it's been necessary to increase the width of the sector in order to include both the anterolateral wall and some of the RV free wall and you should adjust the depth such that none of the atria are clipped and I tend to put the focus point up around about the basal segment of the LV. What are we going to assess in the apical views? Well in the apical four chamber view we're going to get a sense of the LV size and contractility. We're going to look at the RV, look at its size and its contractility and specifically its long axis function and the TAPSI measurement. We're going to look at the two valves on view, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, to look at their thickness and motion. And then we're going to move to the apical five chamber view where we can have a look at the aortic valve and use colour to look for aortic regurgitation. So let's start by taking a look at the left ventricle. And we'll remind ourselves which walls are on view here. So on the right hand side we've got the anterolateral LV wall. And in the centre we have the inferoceptral LV wall. And I've highlighted here which coronary arteries are likely to be supplying these. Once again, you're going to work your eye along the edge of the LV, checking each segment in turn to make sure that it's thickening. Have a look at the synchronicity of the movement, everything coming in towards the centre at the same time. We've already made a one-dimensional measurement of the LV cavity size from our parasitic long axis view, and we're just going to sense check that here, make sure that the LV looks like it's the normal shape and size. One of the common problems when generating an apical four-chamber view is foreshortening. So having the probe too high on the chest wall, it has the effect of rounding off the ventricles rather than having them come to a nice point. There's a degree of foreshortening in this image here, which was unfortunately unavoidable given the fact that we lost our image as we moved the probe lower down on the chest. If we now turn our attention to the right ventricle and the right ventricular size, and what we want is the RV basal diameter to be no more than about two-thirds of the basal diameter of the left ventricle. And it's pretty close in this image. In fact, you could argue that the RV looks slightly dilated, However, in this asymptomatic, healthy young patient, I assert this is probably due to a combination of foreshortening and a slight rotation of the probe. Certainly, the RV didn't appear to be particularly dilated in any of the other views. We then need to think about RV contractility, and we're going to divide the RV contractility into two different parts. We're going to describe the radial contractility and the long axis, or the longitudinal function. The radial function is how much the RV free wall comes in towards the septum, and the long axis function we can see is how much the tricuspid anus, particularly the lateral tricuspid anus, moves up towards the apex during systole. And we're going to make a measurement of the tapsy in a second 
which will give us a number that we can put to that. We're also going to have a look again at the valves. We can see the mitral valve on the right and the tricuspid valve on the left. We can see that the leaflets of both of those valves are thin, and they open all the way during diastole and close nicely during systole. Okay, so now we're going to check the mitral regurgitation in the aortic four chamber view. So we're going to create a colour box, place the colour box such that it covers the entire width of the, a of the mitral valve, so that the mitral valve leaflets remain within the colour box, they open and close. And we're going to cover as much of the left atrium as required to make sure that if there is any jet of MR, that we don't miss the end of it and clip the end of it. And just as we've done previously, we're always going to pan through the valve from one extreme to the other to make sure there's not any uh, regurgitation that's falling behind or in front of the scan plane. Next, let's make a measurement of the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion or TAPSI. Um, to do this, I like to zoom in on the tricuspid annulus so that we minimise any measurement areas. And we're going to put an M mode cursor through the lateral annulus. We're going to record an M mode trace. And then we're going to have a look at scrutinise that M mode trace. We're going to try and follow one line, one of these sort of uh, lines that's moving horizontally across, and follow that line. And one of the problems that people sometimes do is jumping between lines, jumping between structures. Um, and you obviously want to try and avoid that. And here we've got a measurement of 2.5 centimetres, which is clearly normal. So the next view that we capture in our department is using colour over the tricuspid valve to look for tricuspid regurgitation. This isn't one of the views in the minimum data set for BSC level 1 scan, uh, but we always do this in our department. And if you're familiar with using colour boxes and using colour to look for other regurgitation, it's a reasonably easy and quick thing to do. And you can see here that Oscar has got a trivial amount of tricuspid regurgitation. From here we're going to go back to our 2D apical 4 chamber view and we're going to tilt the tail of the probe down towards the patient's abdomen so that we're looking more superficially in the chest, more towards the anterior portion of the chest and the aortic valve starts to become starts to come into view. And here you can see two of the aortic valve leaflets opening and closing and then we're going to put a colour flow box over the aortic valve and over the left ventricle and left ventricle outflow tract and now we're going to be looking for any aortic regurgitation. Also keep an eye open for any turbulent flow within the left ventricle outflow tract, which might suggest that there's some sort of obstruction at this level. So next we're going to move on to the subcostal four chamber view, so I'm going to ask Oscar to lie supine. And the place to probe just below the zipper sternum, with the orientation marker pointing towards Oscar's left, and with the probe pointing towards Oscar's left shoulder. I'm going to have my hand entirely above the probe, just push down ever so slightly and look underneath the ribs, and look at the anterior chest and we'll see the heart there through the liver. In this view we're going to assess RV wall thickness, we're going to have a look at the RV size and contractility, LV size and contractility, and we're going to review again the mitral and tricuspid valves, look at their leaflet thickness and motion. So we've seen the heart already from a number of views, we've already made an assessment of all of these chambers and valves. And often in this view we're just confirming what we've previously seen and making sure we're not missing something. If there's, a, if, if there's a pericardial diffusion inferior to the RV, we're going to pick it up here. From this position, we're going to then rotate the probe 90 degrees anticlockwise and lift the tail of the probe up such that the orientation mark is now pointing towards the patient's head. And we're going to try and position our probe such that we've got about two-thirds of the, of the sector, so the left-hand two-thirds of the sector covering the abdomen and the right-hand third of the sector covering the thoracic contents. And here we can see the heart, you can see the right atrium and the IVC running through the liver into the right atrium. So we need to make a measurement of the IVC calibre, the diameter of the IVC at the widest point. If we can get our cursor to line up parallel to the IVC walls, and it's possible to do this in M mode, here we can see the IVC is at an angle of about sort of 40 degrees. And if we try and use M mode here, we're going to cut across the IVC obliquely and overestimate the IVC's calibre. So instead I'm going to freeze the 2D image and use the calibre tool to make a measurement. And I'm going to measure the IVC about 2 cm below the RA IVC junction, just below where the hepatic vein inserts into the IVC. And in truth, I probably could have got a little bit closer to the hepatic vein with this measurement. OK, all that remains is to have a look at the lung basis. So we're going to take the probe off the front of the chest, and we're going to place the probe in the mid-axillary line on the right-hand side. And we're going to orientate the probe such that the abdominal contents appears on the right-hand side of the image and the thoracic contents appears on the left-hand side of the image. So with our probe set up for cardiac imaging, that means we're going to have the orientation marker pointing towards Oscar's pelvis. I'm going to place the probe in the mid-axillary line over the large abdominal organ that's easy to spot. So on the right, that's going to be the liver. And we're going to try and identify the medial portion of the diaphragm. We're going to try and follow the diaphragm over the liver. And we're going to try and visualise the lateral portion of the diaphragm. And most of the time we're going to fail to do that because there's going to be aerated lung in the costophrenic angle. 
at the Canal of Glittery to have you. If we are able to trace the diaphragm all the way over the liver, that's going to be because there's something in that space that's transmitting our ultrasound signal. And that's going to be fluid or solid. Most of the time that will be either pleural effusion or collapsed or consolidated lung. Then we're going to move the probe over to the left-hand side, place the probe over the spleen, again orientation marker down towards the pelvis, and we'll slide or rock the probe so that we're viewing up into the left hemithorax. And again, we're going to try and trace the diaphragm over the spleen, try and see the lateral portion of the hemidiaphragm if we can, and Oscar, of course, that won't be possible. OK, so that completes our focus scan. So to finish with, I'm just going to summarise those views that we're going to obtain during a BSC Level 1 scan. Each of the views here that are highlighted in white are those that are mandatory views that form part of the BSC minimum data set, whilst those in red are additional scans that we always perform in our department. Starting with the parastandard long axis views, you're going to start with a deep view, you're going to decrease the depth and come up to the cardiac focus view, you're going to measure the left ventricular diameter at end diastole, you're going to put some colour over the uh, aortic valve, you're going to put some colour over the mitral valve looking for regurgitation, and then you're going to make an assessment of the aortic root, and if you want to, you can measure that as well. We're then going to rotate the probe clockwise 90 degrees to get the parasonal short axis views. We're going to start at the level of the aortic valve. If you like, you can put some colour over the aortic valve. And then we're going to pan down through the left ventricle, first coming to the mitral valve, the basal segments, then down to the mid segments, and finally towards the apex. From there, we're going to move the probe over to the apex of the heart, orientation marker towards the left, and we're going to capture the apical four chamber view. We're going to put some colour over the mitral valve. We're going to measure the tapsy. If you want, you can put some colour over the tricuspid valve, with some tricuspid regurgitation. And then you're going to put the tail of the probe down, so we see superficially, and you can see the apical five chamber view, see the aortic valve, and put some colour over the aortic valve. To finish, we're going to place the probe just inferior to the zipper sternum and capture the subcostal four chamber view. And then we're going to rotate the probe anticlockwise 90 degrees to visualise the IVC. We're going to make an M-mode measurement of the IVC. If you want, you can then use the same probe to go and have a look at the lung bases on the right and left-hand sides. All that remains is to thank you for watching, and if you have any comments, please leave them below.